Hi, everybody, and welcome to the CARES Academy March webinar, words from the assertive community treatment team, what we all know as the ACT team. My name is Larie Talbert, and I'm a person in long-term recovery. What that means to me is that I have not used drugs to change how I feel in over 11 and a half years. Recovery has changed my life for the better. Um, I'm a better mother, sister, I'm an awesome grandmother, I'm a better coworker, I'm a better community me member. You know, I'm dependable and I show up and I speak out about my recovery because I want others to know that recovery is possible. Before we get started, I would like to go over the housekeeping. Everyone who completes this webinar in its entirety will receive 1.5 CEUs. You will receive an email in a few days that's going to serve as your confirmation of your attendance as the Georgia Council does not send out certificates for webinars. Also, everybody will be muted for the duration of the webinar, but we still want to hear from you. So the way to do that is you can either raise your hand or you can type a question in to the question box. Um, and um, if you're able to speak, I will call on you or I'll unmute you, but um, we welcome all your participation. Also, if you look out in the handout section, you'll see two handouts. One is the presentation and the other is just a handout that the presenters wanted to give to you. So you can download that at any time during the webinar. Um, Today we have two CARES and um, one CPS mental health um, here who will be doing this webinar. And both are. Uh, they're, they're both, they're, okay, correction, they're yeah. both CPS ADs and CPS mental health. And they both work on an ACT team in different parts of the state. And I give you, I'm gonna start off with the um, alphabetical order. I'll give you Tramel Brown. He can give you well, my name is Tramel Brown, but I go by Mello. Uh, I'm a person in long-term recovery. And uh, what that means to me is that I no longer live in the limitations of my diagnosis and I haven't used any drugs or alcohol uh, to self-medicate since 2016. Uh, what recovery has given me is giving me a, a different outlook on life. It's uh, allowed me the opportunity to be a present father. Uh, I'm a loyal husband. Um, I'm a I'm a I'm a, a loyal brother. I have uh, nieces and nephews that now I get to be able to participate in their lives, uh, and I speak out about my recovery just because for so long uh, it, it was silenced, uh, silenced by uh, shame, silenced by guilt, and um, so I'm glad now I have an opportunity to speak out and uh, be the voice on the other side of that silence. Okay. Hi, my name is Dwayne Smith. Okay, my name is Dwayne Smith, and I'm a person on long-term recovery. And what that means to me, in the last nine and a half years, I have found no reason to use any mind or move off in this substance, which have afforded me to be able to be a, a father to my children, a grandfather to my grandchildren, uh, an entrepreneur, and also allow me to reach out and work on that team to serve others who are dealing with their recovery and to be a voice for them until they're able to be a voice to themselves. So now I went from a ministry society to a pillar in society. All right, thank you guys. So I hand it over to um, Dwayne and Tramelo. Tramel. All right, guys, this is a, a presentation that me and Dwayne put together uh, with words from the ACT team, just to kind of give you guys a, a preface and a little bit more detailed information about exactly what an ACT team is and what an ACT team does for peers in the community. So I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let Dwayne uh, start off, but before we get going, I just wanted to let everyone know that we are doing this presentation as a general overview of what the ACT team services provide. Um, myself and Dwayne are not actual representatives for the companies that we work for. We are just here to educate peers with a general overview of the ACT team services. Okay, now we have different ACT team services. You know, uh, ACT, the word ACT stands for Assertive 
community treatment. And it has different names. As you see, we have ACT for Assertive Community Treatment. We have PACT for Program Assertive Community Treatment. Then we have Assertive Outreach Program. We have Mobile Treatment Teams. We have Continuous Treatment Teams. And some say you got to be out of your mind to work this field because it is, it is, it, it can be tested. Okay. Yeah, our ACT teams are the highest level of care that our peers receive after being discharged out of the hospital and um, released from jail. So this is a really assertive treatment when it says assertive community treatment, meaning that yeah, we, we, we are really intense with, when it comes to our treatment, not that we are, are rigid in our approach to <clears throat> the different peers that we serve. It's just that we, it's, it's an ongoing, continuous uh, type of treatment. You know, you must be out of your mind to work here. I don't want that to scare anybody, but this this is one of these these teams are basically the front line of treatment. Okay. And with that with that note to be said, you got to understand that at you know, number treat individuals to qualify to be to get at service, you have to have a severe and persistent challenge. So that's what that's his qualification to be a to receive at service, you know, and at, you know, at, at deliver in several different models. And at the, not a case management program, but it's a community treatment and rehabilitation service. Got at, at approaches from a whole, from a several different angles. That's true. So I just wanted to propose the question out to the people that uh, our peers that are. Of participating in this webinar, uh, are you familiar with what an ACT team is? And Larry, if you want to allow some people to speak, that'd be great. If anybody wants to raise their hand okay. and say what their understanding of an ACT team. Okay, come on, guys, raise your hand. I'm going to have to call on somebody. Um, Berlinda, is your right hand right? You're self muted. Unmute yourself, ma'am. Hi guys, how you doing today? Um, well, how you doing? I'm doing great in the midst of it all. My understanding of ACT program is that you're the guys that jump in there right away to let people know that they're not alone. You know, that they've got somebody they can talk to that'll be there for them and steer them on the right road. But I really would like to know more about it because it sounds like it you might be crazy to do it, but it sounds like something I'd want to do. <laughs> hey, Belinda, you All right. Say, right? You know, What's up, Melo? I mean, What's going on there? Here at 37, y'all know you the best. Yes, sir. Okay, y'all yeah, okay. learn from the but but Belinda, you absolutely you absolutely uh correct because it is very rewarding because you come to individuals, like I said, the qualification for act is to, uh, to be living with uh, severe and consistent, uh, persistent mental uh, uh, challenge. And when mm -hmm. an individual comes to you and you help them, you help them find, find their way, I like to say, uh, you know, oh. you support them, you support them in finding their way. And as you support them in finding their way, it gives them a sense of reward. You know, when you feel, uh, you know, when you know you support an individual that, that was, hospitalized more than three times in a year and now this person got a job and living on their own is very rewarding thank you yeah um, you got something i'm sorry go ahead now just about to say that i can totally understand that because that would be helpful but that's all for me thank you belinda we got thank another you. hand raised the lisa ward um, unmute yourself. You can speak. Delisa? All right, that's it. Anybody else have um, a question or a comment? Dwight L. Okay, Martin? here I am. Oh, okay, go ahead. Sorry about that. Hello. Um, yes, I see that it is intense because from where I've been, I never saw myself wanting to be clean and the things that I took to uh, for granted, like 
being a functioning alcoholic, but losing everything and going to prison, um, I lost hope. And just from meeting, uh, Miss, talking to Miss Larray and the kindness that she gave me, and the people that I've met along the way, uh, being three years sober, I I have hope and I know that I can do this, you know, and I just appreciate the intensity of it because that's what it takes. I'm hardcore, you know, <laughs> I have a mission. I'm on a mission just like I was when I was doing the drug. I was on a mission and I'm on a mission now for my recovery. <laughs> All right. Very Thank good. You. Keep, keep going. Okay. We have and, another question. Is it okay, or do y'all need to move on? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I love engaging. All right, Dwight Elmar, you are self muted. Unmute yourself, and you can speak. I unmute it now. There you go. Okay, yes. Sir. I'd just like to ask the team. Basically, now the certain community team. Um, how many people are we talking about? Are we talking about a team? Uh, how many people are made up of this team? Is it through CARES, the certain community team? Is it a part of CARES? Is it, I heard you mentioned something about working with other agencies or you're not a part of the uh, Georgia Substance Abuse Council, something you said earlier on in reference that you do not represent um, the company that you're that with. We work with. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, okay. the ACT team, is, it's not through CARES, but we do uh, work for different for other agencies, and it consists of primarily of a team of teams. You know, excuse me. Uh, pardon me. Did you hear me? Ten member. Yeah, ten member teams. Okay. You know, and we're really will be eleven when you count the team lead and so forth. So it, it, it consists of a ten ten member team, and, and that's something that we're gonna go more in depth on as we oh, go okay. on in this line. Yeah, so we will, we will, that question will be answered because we're coming to the point where we will go more in depth on that. Okay, one, yeah. other quick, one other quick question. Um, now, is now being a part of the certain community team, is now we, we are we totally uh, so centered here on mental health or are we also centering uh, uh, this community team around a drug addiction as well? It's, we consist of both. You have to. You have to approach them both. You have to approach them both. Uh, it, it's about it's about uh, creating a wholeness of a person. Oh. So you have to approach them both. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Yeah, you're welcome, Dwight. And also, when I was speaking earlier before the presentation got started, is is I just wanted to make it clear that we are not spokespersons for the companies that we work for. Uh, so I did that as uh, I guess a disclaimer, making sure that you guys know I'm not. A representative of the company who I work for. This is just a general overview of what an act team does. Okay, let me get one more. I, Belinda, she's got her hand raised. Belinda, unmute yourself. I don't know, but I'll just read the comment. Then it says. Working with the ACT program and supporting individuals, what are some guidelines that may interact with interacting with assisting the clients? Okay, one of one of the guidelines is is the you want to make a connection with that individual. You know, you have to come in and sometimes you may you may share a part of your but you don't also don't want that individual to feel as though y'all are friends, but you want to make that connection with the individual, where the individual is comfortable uh, talking with you and opening up to you. So the main thing is being, especially from a peer, uh, peer to peer point of view, from a CPS point of view, with CPS AD, uh, CPS, you want to be able to make a connection, you know, with that individual. Yeah, I agree with that too. The way in making that connection is probably uh, the biggest part of of the treatment and how how we're able to engage with the peers that are on the act team that are receiving act team services. And um, and I think we'll go deeper into that once we go through a couple of more slides. Uh, are there any more questions at this point? No, sir. 
All right, if not, we're going to move on to the Thank next. Can I ask you a question? Um, are you ready for the first poll question? Yeah, let's do that. Okay, yeah. great. All right, guys. This is an opportunity for everybody. Um, the first poll question is, if I can get to it, I am a CARES. Are you a CARES 1 through 10, cohort 11 through 20, cohort 21 to 30, or 31 above? Or are you not a CARES, but you love at least one CARES? <laughs> Just for fun. <laughs> and I would like to see 100% participation, please. And all right, we're gonna um close the close it. And so we have there are no cares here in attendance that are um under cohort 10, but there's 14% are 11 through 20, 29% is 21 through 30. 29 the other 29 is oh wow 29 is 31 or above and then there are 29 percent of us here that are not cares but loves at least one cares awesome. <laughs> that's all right that's all right oh. <laughs> yeah thank you all right guys all right so moving on to um the act principles uh, these are our practice principles. Our act is characterized by a team approach, like we spoke with about earlier. It's about 10 of us on the team. We'll go through each individual team member and what their role is on the team uh, further on. Uh, the term in vivo services, uh, the term in vivo means uh, experimental. So that goes way back to when we were first uh, doing our CARES training. That's just meeting people where they are and um, not using the one size fits all approach. Um, the experimental part of the services would, you know, just kind of filling out the peer who you're talking with, seeing what interests them and trying to figure out what their strengths are. And we can use that as motivation for them to succeed in their treatment. Um, ACT has a small caseload. Now, like I said, this is just a general overview. My personal ACT team does not have a small caseload. Our services, we serve about 85 uh, different peers. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, my personal caseload is about 30 to 35 who I see every week, uh, but I am contracted to have interactions with each and every peer on that caseload. Uh, did you want to say same, something about that, Dwayne? Yeah, same here. I believe that that, that that point about having a small caseload, I believe you can draw a line through that. Because I, <laughs> I don't know, no act team with, with a small caseload. You know, I mean, uh, you know, like the team I work for, we come in about 70 people, and I have to see the whole 70 at least twice in one month. You know, so that doesn't have a small caseload. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the criteria, I think, for doing for billing for that, each one of these, each individual on that caseload has to have anywhere from six to 10 visits per month. That's true. That's true. Uh, moving on to the, the time unlimited services, what that term means is that it, there is no specific time limit that people can receive services from ACT. Um, I have a, a few peers that have been on there uh, roughly about maybe about 12 years, and I got peers on the caseload that have just, just participated in, on, in receiving ACT team services uh, less than a year. Um, we can't dismiss anybody off the ACT team. It is completely up to their standard of functioning, whether or not if they transition to a lower level of care. Yes. A shared caseload on the ACT team means that, well, that's another meaning of a team approach, a team approach to treatment. We share the caseload uh, between the different staff members that are on the team. Of uh, the flexible service delivery, meaning that another, another way that we meet people where they are, uh, we go to their homes, we meet them in their neighborhoods, in the community. Uh, you know, they can receive services in the clinic. It really all depends on the peer and what where they, where they feel comfortable um, in receiving the services. A fixed point of responsibility means each individual on the team has a certain 
a certain criteria that they are to meet uh, with the peers who they're working with um, for a CARES or CPS. Their fixed point of responsibility would be to implement a RAP, which is a Wellness Recovery Action Plan. And that's pretty much the CPS's main main role um, on the team is to imp getting them to implement a, a RAP at least uh, three times a month. Crisis management available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah, this is when it gets tough. This is when um, your feet hit the ground and, and you just got to be ready, ready for whatever that may happen. Um, whenever a crisis does occur, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, meaning that the peer can contact any member of staff. And if they're going through a crisis, we are there and make ourselves available to assist them in, um, I guess, uh, smoothing out the crisis or either getting them admitted to the hospital if needed. Okay. My main goal is to okay. try to keep them out of the hospital. Yeah. Okay, on the team, in fact, with that being said, in fact, I, I'm on call now. So each member of our team, we take a week. So the rotation, it comes by one, a week every two months, and we be on 24 7 call. So if a peer uh, going through any, anything, uh, you know, that they can call, that on call number and speak with her. And like I say, if they having a crisis or they may need to go to the hospital or whatever, we would go out to them and deal with the situation accordingly. Right, good deal. So here at you want to you want to do this one here, Dwayne? Yeah. Okay. The act principle principles. You know, uh uh Act is for peers with the most challenging and persistent problems. And as I said before, use it for a peer to qualify for act service. They're either being hospitalized or incarceration three times within the last 12 months. And, you know, and, you, and, and as you would see, programs that are here more closer to the act model, they seem to get the best outcome. You know, most, most like most programs that, you know, are here to act model. So do get do seem the results do seem to be you know come out favorable that programs that do not okay yeah that's pretty good right. you hit it right on the head that one so the primary responsibilities for the services this right here goes to Dwight's question about um the team and what the team members are the team members are experienced in psychiatry uh psychology nursing social work rehabilitation and substance abuse treatment and employment so rather than preferring the peers to multiple different programs and different services the ag team provides the treatment and services peers need our team members consist of a psychiatrist who is our md um, our, our team has two nurses that work on there, two social workers that are paraprofessionals. One has a degree in sociology, one has a degree in social work. We also had two substance abuse counselors, which um, treat, uh, help assist in the substance abuse treatment and then employment, meaning they have both rehab specialists from pe two people on the team that are uh, specialized in finding employment for our peers. So this is what we mean by a team approach. And it is so awesome that as a CPS or CARES, that we can sit at the table with all of these experienced people who have degrees and we can use our certifications and our voices still be heard at the table. Yeah. And as a CPS, not only do we uh, sit there and make the first contact and we are, uh, and we actually become the most important one because we the one that uh, engage our coworkers on the best way of approaching the appeal to make a connection as well as advocate on this peer behalf when need be. I believe I have all the wisdom with some college degrees, you know, to get to get things done favorable for a peer. Yeah, and that is true, me as well. God, that is so awesome. And later on in the slides it'll show how the peer is mentioned to be the most important person on the team. Here you go, Tom. You want to do this one, Dwayne? Okay. Yeah. Help is provided where it needed. Rather than working with peers in an office or hospital. That team member work with a peer in their home, neighborhood, or other places where that problem 
and stress arise and where they need support to feel. See that we truly mean the person where they are. Because you may meet the person in the park. You know, you may meet this person uh, at the social security office, you know, at the food stamp office, you know, in their home, you know, out, you know, any place. You know, as the CPS, you're going to meet them wherever they are and wherever they stretch and survive. You know, you may have an individual that all of a sudden they're in a grocery store and the crowd or the craving may get to them. And you have to meet them there. And they may call you. You have to go there and meet them and support them and teach them skill building activities to really support themselves. And I, and I also think that this is a great concept because a lot of people don't have a stigma about going into a clinic and just being around in, in that type of environment. So in order for the peer to feel comfortable, we'll meet them wherever they would like to. Some people like to meet at the homes or some people like to meet at parks, like what he was saying. Uh, so we just, we just kind of just try to make the peer as comfortable as possible, I think, with comfort comes trust and then they, they're more more liable to open up so that way treatment can be possible. Okay. Help yeah, we have. Yeah, help is provided where it is needed. You know, uh, as I was saying before, rather than seeing the consumer on a few times a month, that team member with different type of institutes contact consumers as often as necessary. And as we move further on, you will see all the different services where uh, uh, Tremere touched on it earlier about how we have a psychiatrist. On our team, we got two clinicians. You know, we got uh, uh, two case managers. You know, we have a, a CPS. We got a, a Sussman Bruce Council. We got a vocational rehab council. So, each individual uh, is getting different expertise on a necessary, more, usually as often as necessary. And as we mentioned before, uh, support is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You know, even during the midst of, of this pandemic, we still have peers to still getting their support. Yeah, Vince, you want to smile on that? Oh, I, I do not. I think you hit every point there really good. Uh, so the shared caseload is the ACT team members do not have individual caseloads, um, which, uh, you know, give or take, I, I think sometimes that we do. Um, instead of the team, we share the responsibilities for the peers in the program. Um, so I guess what this means is that I don't, I don't work with one person just because I want to work with that individual. Uh, this the individual receives uh, treatment from every different aspect that's on the team. Right. You know, make... I would like to oh, go, go, ahead. Ahead. go ahead. You go ahead. Now, I just want I just want to smile on that because you know we're working on the ad team. It is true that each each consumer on the team get to know every individual there. You know, get to know every individual on the team. So not to rely. Uh, uh, just depend on seeing one person and building a report with one person, but actually building a report with each and every individual there. You know, because like I said, if one person leaves, that that uh, consumers still have to be comfortable enough to reach out to the team members. Now, in the East period, they, they do get to know multiple members of the team, so that way we all we all speak about the. The progress in their treatment with each peer every day we meet every day and we consult with each other and talk about each uh, each peer that is on the caseload um, so that way if anybody gets sick or leaves that way each all of the members still know something about them that way they can make the connection you want to do this one here Dwayne? okay yeah no preset time but limited on service now that gonna vary from what organization that you work for. Because with some organization, you know, if you can, if a consumer can maintain stability for a year time, they be, uh, they be passed on to what we call intensive case management, ICM. You know, cause 
want, because that's the whole act purpose is to get this individual, you know, where they, where they're stable enough to, not to return back to the hospital, not to return back, you know, to incarceration. But at any time, once they are are passed on to a, to a, a, where they don't need as intense uh, uh, support, they can always, if need be, they can always return back. You know, so like, but so there's no set time. It may take a year, may take two years, may ten, take ten years for this individual to get there. But act will continue to work with them until they get there. Yeah, and I think that's pretty awesome too because it's, it gives that it gives that concept of never never giving up on an individual and the peers that are never discharged from the act programs just because they're not compliant. This is not like a DRC program where they report every day, and if you don't uh, pass your your urinalysis or if you don't show up to these um, certain meetings every week, that you can't get kicked off the act team. We we are intensive with our treatment when we don't ever give up on an individual ever at all, no matter how complicated or persistent their symptoms may be. We always continue to to provide support in any way that we can until, and then also with going back to the in vivo services, either way that we can try different approaches until that individual is able to have successful recovery. That sounds good. Um, is it okay to have a couple of questions? I have a couple of hands raised. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, Raquel Hightower, um you are self muted unmute yourself and you can speak okay can you hear me yes well, okay hello gentlemen good job i was wondering well, you. um has your services been uh, changed or affected from this coronavirus um you know going out into the field and and visiting with consumers and, and or peers and things like that and and if it has i mean what are some workarounds that you all have um, incorporated into your routine okay one of the things that we're required to do before we go out to any peer's home we are we are we call you know we call whether it's in a group home or whatever we call and we speak speak to, to the individual and we have to poke our call about whether or not they are are they experiencing any the coughing, fever, you know, uh, uh, really like a, a shortness of breath? And then even once we get there, we still further use protocol by keeping our distance from them and, and communicate with them. Instead of close up contact, you know, we try to maintain anywhere from three to six feet away from them as we do this. Now. And for us individuals that may be in a nursing home setting, a group on said we're not allowed to see them individuals. Yeah, same as well with uh, with our team as well. We've been taking different precautions, keeping hand sanitizer in our cars because unofficially our cars are our office since we, we are always out in the field. Uh, keep Lysol in to wipe down any surfaces that if you feel like that peer may be um, exhibiting, displaying some different uh, symptoms like the cough and, and the fever. Uh, we also can do telephone conferences where we can call the individual and have them, you know, come outside and just keeping that three to six foot distance between each each individual. And um, as far as our treatment team meetings, we we're not going into the clinic anymore. We are doing our treatment teams uh, via video. Uh, that way, here. All, yeah, the team that way the team can still consult and let them know the progress of each individual that's on the team. Um, and uh, we do have a few consumers that um, are diagnosed with different immune um, deficiencies uh, and to keep them safe, uh, we, we, will, we, we won't do any face-to-face -face contact with those individuals just to keep them safe. Okay. We have Good one deal. more question, one more hand raised. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Oh no, you're 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 okay. I was just saying, good deal. That's that's excellent, and I'm so glad that um you all are taking precautions uh, for yourselves and for the population that you serve. That's really important, also. So good job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Belinda, you are unmuted. Can you unmute yourself or is your hand raised by mistake? 
Either it's Belinda or Paula. I don't know which one. It was it was Paula. Okay. Hi. I wanted to touch bases on the question uh, regarding the homelessness. Um, working with the on the ACT team, what is um, how do y'all help with? Give me an example of how y'all work with the homeless and to help them to get from homelessness to home to having a home or getting into treatment or something like that. Okay. Uh, for us, with the organization that I work for, we have a mm -hmm. program called called respite, respite housing, where individuals are coming out the hospital or uh, jail with no one to go. We have apartments uh, that we normally put them in with two men, two person apartment that we normally put them in there uh, for for uh, six to sixty two. I mean, sometimes it, 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 they may get a stand out with a twelve week, which gives them enough time to. Maybe I'll uh, get their credentials, their, their uh, um, ID, you know, birth certificate, and so forth, and to give us enough time to put in for them uh, uh, one of the housing vouchers, because several different housing vouchers that I offer. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, and, and same, same for us as well, Paula. Uh, once they're discharged out of the hospital, we try to have them stable housing before they're discharged. But some of our peers do unfortunately end up homeless. Uh, we provide, we link with services in the community as far as different shelters, um, different men's group, uh, women homes. Uh, we also uh, have the the vote rehab specialist that way we, we can help them find employment. We also have the uh, housing housing liaison where they meet with us as well and if certain members on the team meet criteria and that they've been stable enough we can put them in apartments uh, we but we also want to make sure the only reason why we have criteria before the housing is because we don't want any peer to be harmed in any kind of way uh, just because this peer may need housing i don't want to disrupt another individual's recovery um, if they would not work well together if that makes sense All right, one more hand raise, guys, and then you can go on. Alvin, you are unmuted. Unmute yourself. Thank you. I think I'm unmuted now. You good? Uh, I want to know how do people get referred to you? Do you have connections in these hospitals and jails, and they just refer these people to you as they're discharging them? Uh, a lot of times that is the case, and different organizations may uh, refer them to our organization. Like we get a lot scraped from the hospital and scraped from the jail. And I, I don't know if you heard of the settlement act, you know, uh, which, which, which consists of NIC project, uh, but a lot of referrals come to us through that because uh, uh, you have individuals that, that uh, rep legal representation for individuals that are dealing with long term, you know, challenges. So a lot yeah. of times they have, the court will have them, the court will refer them to us. And we would pick up the ball from there because we are individuals that may be on probation or whatever, and we refer them, meet them with their probation officer, and they have the first thing, you know, that 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 you know, whatever whatever need that consumer need, we refer them to that part of it, uh, at a way where that where that consumer can function. And a lot of times, but you also also now it is a referral process that you may go to now i can't really expound on that too much because that's above my pay grade and that's the mm -hmm. thing leave we have to do but uh, i know that most of uh, most of our clients are referred straight from the hospital and the jails yeah that is true the team lead does do all the assessments and the therapists on the team may do some assessments as well before they are uh placed on the nag team but well, those assessments come from doctors in the hospital where they presently may be before they are discharged um then we also get people straight out of csus coming out of the crisis stabilization unit and come right out um, to the ag team so that 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 determining factor the way they get on the ag team is is probably like like Dwayne said way above our pay grade but uh yeah. they are it is a referral uh, type program thank you um i'm working at a hospital in birmingham a really large hospital I see people on the detox unit, and I've already seen people who would have met and exceeded your criteria of three hospitalizations uh, in six months. You know, it's pretty right. amazing. 
I, I, I would suggest if you could to look at uh, to find out what what organization in your area that have a act team. Yeah, I'm quite sure it's an organization in your area that does have an act team. And a lot of times, hospitals have an act team. Like being in the Metro Atlanta uh, area, I know Grady has three act teams. So a lot mm -hmm. of the hospitals do do have act teams. Yeah, our that, hospital our hospital has social workers that uh, try to set up something for when someone's being discharged, but there's no follow up once they discharge them. I mean, having people wow. to be able to stay with them once they get out right. is so awesome. Wow. Yeah. So maybe look to some behavior help, uh, some behavior help companies that, uh, in your area. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. That's all I have for right now, guys. Thank you. All right. So I think that for time purposes, we are going to um, kind of skip through a few of these slides. Please don't feel cheated on the presentation. We do have the uh, handout PDFs here hand, uh, where you can download all of the slides if you want to get through those. What I really want to get to, Dwayne, if you don't mind kind of pushing forward to what the role of the CARES and the CPS does on the team. That sounds great to me. Okay. All right, so we'll talk about different staffing and then from here, I think the slides go to the peers position. So the Ag Team Staffing is a team approach. 90% um, or more of the peers have contact with multiple team members, at least one team member per week. Um, our, our practicing team leader is uh, L LPC, I believe. Um, it's a full-time program supervisor, also called a team lead, and provides direct services at least 50% of the time. Our team lead is always there. Our team lead has met with each individual that is on our team. On the ACT team's caseload and our individual caseloads um, has built the rapport with these individuals and like I said have assessed them since being discharged from the hospital that way they can kind of guide us in the right direction on who needs to be working with who whose approach uh, may be more suitable for the peer at that time and over over the course of their their recovery um, kind of can appoint each team member to each individual Our program okay. serving 100 peers and has at least there you go, Dwayne. You go take over that one. Okay. Now, as you see, it said program serving 100 peers has at least one more full full time psychiatrist. Yes, on the act team, you must have a psychiatrist because that is the individual who can do the prescription of the medication and to the client or to the consumer get the medication that works best for them. And as our team, we do have two full-time nurses because a lot of individuals may be on these injections. So it would take uh, two nurses to go out and get these individuals their injection. And most injections, most uh, consumers get an injection every 28 days. And okay, we have we have a system of abuse counselor, and this is what she do. She she deal with, and we have she holds a system of abuse group once a week, and she go out in the field and deal with individuals that has a substance abuse disorder. Okay, we have clinicians, the team lead and a, is a clinician as well as uh, another clinician. And then to go out to make sure the treatment plan and all the updated. Because the rest of the staff, we're gonna uh, 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 approach the, uh, the consumer and support them and according to their treatment plan. How their treatment plan consists of what their desire and how they want their life to be. You know, we're, so we also have, like the road up, we're a care coordinator, which is the same thing as uh, this case manager. And then we have vocational rehab. Vocational rehab help individuals who are trying to enter back into the workforce or like to go to school. And so we have someone there to support them. Then we have, uh, then we have the CPS, CPS AD, you know, which uh, I go out and who is the main screen. Uh, uh, at, we're at the side going to it now. It is the main screen of the act team. Because, you know, cause this, cause this peer specialist, you know, really, you know, it, it, 
help every other position to function. Because, you know, even though they have degrees and, and, and different different elements of the team, but the CPS brings that, it's the glue that holds the whole team together. Uh, it's the person with the lived experience that can enlighten the team, the staff, you know, uh, from their lived experience, as well as make a connection with their peer. You can take on that. Yeah, I agree. I have been um I have been told by several people on the team that the peer specialist is the most important person that they have on the team uh, due to the ability to connect with the peers by the lived experience. Uh, I don't know if everybody's familiar with the clinician side of treatment, um, but it can turn into a, a mode of hierarchy um, from from the doctors, from the nurses. The peers feel like they're always being told what to do. Um, from a peer specialist, as a peer specialist, we are here to make recovery look the way that we want. They want it to look, which is why they do do a treatment team, which is why they are assessed by substance abuse counselors. And if and if they don't want to receive certain services, they don't have to. And I, I think that's pretty awesome because we as peers just kind of support them in whatever they want to do. I mean, if they want, and it, it sounds bad, but if they want to continue living a life that they're living, that is okay. Uh, we don't try to force any type of treatment on them. What we do is we just try to utilize, and I, this is where the motivational interviewing comes in, talking with them, seeing exactly where their strengths are, what they want out of it, and then we just kind of shine it up and make it look pretty for them so that way they can want recovery. <clears throat> yeah, and, and to add on to that, I uh, thank you for, for bringing that up, brother. To add on that, being on that team is not an absence team, but we're a harm reduction team. Uh, as he was saying, if a peer choose that lifestyle, you know, we can't, it's not our position to tell them, no, you can't do that. You can't do it if that's what their choice is. But our position is to do harm reduction. You know, to find, you know, just to help the peer to see uh, where, where the harm they're doing, what's the benefit, and what's the harm, and what they're doing. Good stuff, good stuff. I'm going to move on to the next slide here. <clears throat> and this is the meat and potatoes right here, guys. This is what the webinar is all about, uh, the role of the certified peer specialist. I'm going to read this definition of what I got here, and it kind of goes over the different duties of a CPS on the team. And then uh, we'll go probably over one more slide, and then we'll have questions from um, the audience. Uh, certified peer specialist is fully integrated into the team and promotes peer self-determination and decision-making and provides essential expertise and consultation to the entire team to promote culture in which each peer's point of view and preferences are recognized, understood, respected, and integrated into treatment, rehabilitation, and community self-help activities. What I love about this definition is the part where it says I provide essential expertise. The reason why I'm an expert in recovery is because I've actually lived it myself and I am currently living it myself. So what I do for the peer is to kind of kind of show them what recovery can look like on the other side of the struggle. Uh, the CPS will conduct a wellness and recovery action plan with each peer on an ongoing basis. Each CPS has the ability to serve as an advocate a life coach or mentor, develop community uh, support, assist in the development of rehabilitation goals, facilitate resolution of issues, or provide education on the importance of maintaining personal wellness and recovery. So the, C so the CPS on the team um, is a social worker. Uh, the, the CPS on the team is a voc rehab specialist. Uh, we have expertise in doing all, the, all of these things because we've actually done it ourselves. And this is why I feel like the certified peer specialist is, is always mentioned as the most important person on the team because our expertise is in every, every field of where they have a specialist. Uh, we have experience with taking medications. So that way we can talk to our peers about taking medications. Can we make them take the medication? Absolutely not. But what we can do is share our lived experience and show the benefits of, of med compliance and then just kind of 
kind of get them to understand the, the risk and the benefits of taking medication or not taking medication. Dwayne, you want to add anything to that? Yes, because you, you really smiled on it now, Melo, because one of the things that I have experienced when, you know, working in this field, when you uh, when you are having a session with a, with a consumer and when you make the comment that when I experienced that, this is what I did, if you can watch their body language in that place where you see like a light went up, you went, yes. You know, and you share a brief part of your story. Right, right then, you make that connection. Because now he said, oh, you like me. You know, where from a clinical point of view, it's, you know, it's like they always have tried to tell him or lead him into what he want, he want to do. But when you share your point of view, now you become that mentor whether you want to or not, whether you chose that position or not, you become that life coach. for them Because now they're watching you and seeing where you've been. Since I have uh, been working in this field, I have uh, supported several individuals with uh, paternal CPS, both CARES and mental health CPS. You know, so you do actually become that mentor. Yes, you do. And then and to be able to serve as an advocate as well, I think I'm gonna stick with the with the with the uh, topic of medication because that can be kind of a sensitive subject when it comes to our peers. Uh, because first, they really don't feel you have some that don't feel like that they need it, and then you have some people that are willing to take the medications but feel like they could alter some things in their medication list. And I've served as an advocate for peers on, on the ag team. So when they do meet with the psychiatrist, I will sit in there with them and kind of coach the conversation so that way they can express themselves in a way that can be receptive to the, the medical doctor or the nurse, whoever may be on the team. Somebody may be experiencing a little too much drowsiness and they kind of want to decrease um, a particular medication so that they can feel more functional. Um, we would sit down with the doctor, figure out different ways that we can approach this, um, discuss the risk and the benefits of it. So the doctor may say, well, the reason why we have you on such a dosage of medication is because of this and it's helping assist with this. And so that way we can just kind of, that way the peer can feel involved and engaged in their own recovery. They're not being told what to do. There is no no chains, no ball and chain attached to, to the peer when it comes to this treatment. Um, the peer walks side by side with them. Hey, um, yep. your hands raised. Is it okay or you want to wait a few minutes? Because um, you know I, this goes over to six thirty, right? Yeah, we're we're making it last to six thirty, so it's all good with the questions. Okay, all right. Well, um, Belinda. Unmute yourself if you want to speak. Hey guys, I was listening to uh, what you were talking about as far as the TPS being able to help motivate that person, especially when they need to talk to their doctor. I did experience that when I worked for Right Side Up, where they would come to me prior to even coming to their their clinician. And it was the comfortability of being able to say, look, this is what I need. This is what I think. How can I explain this or get my doctor to understand it? So um, this is real encouraging. And, and I heard you also, um, the other gentleman, when he spoke about Grady having three teens, do all hospitals have three teams or it fluctuates? It fluctuates, you know, because uh, Grady is the only one I know of that have three teams, you know, because it's simple, you know, uh, uh, most hospitals don't have um, at teams, but Grady is one that they have because we deal with a large population. You know, well, it's the company that I work for, you know, we have, we have several at teams. Yeah, in our okay. area in Augusta, I think uh, the team that I work for is the only ag team in, in the area, in the, in the Augusta area. So I think it all depends on the population of the city. 
Okay, because I was I was trying to figure if we even have one in Rockdale. I'm gonna have to um yes yes get more uh, into that. I work, company I work for have an acting that serves Rockdale. You know, I work for a a, a group one here, and we have an ad team that 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 cover Rockdale. You know, okay. Renee, you know, New New County. Oh, that we have an ad team. That I work on the the Cal Fullerton ad team. Okay, I might need to get some information from you on that. All right, no problem. Okay. Um, Dwight, you are unmuted. Please unmute yourself. Dwight, did you have a question? There you yes, go. I do. Yes, I just was just curious. Dwayne and the other individual's name was what? Tramel. Tramel, right. Okay, yeah. now I'm I'm listening to what you're saying and I'm trying to get an understanding and trying to become a peer support specialist myself. Uh, now, are you both peer, a CPS, a, a peer support specialist? Is that my yeah. right to? Okay, so now is that the same as a peer support coach? Uh, yes, they, they're pretty much the same thing, but only uh, a, peer, a, a CPS is someone with the lived experience, but a coach can be someone that is just in a support role. They may not necessarily have the lived experience. They may they may not necessarily have the experience to have they you know live, the, they to live have lived the experience. experience. Right. Oh, okay, okay. So, but do I have to be certified to be a support coach? That I don't know. I don't know. Oh, okay. One yeah. other quick question. Now, so the Georgia Substance Abuse Council would they refer me to you and? Well, it's two part question. Would they refer me to you? And having only ten members, how would I? Only having ten members, how would I uh, uh, possibly be able to be a part of that team if it's only ten members in this area? Okay. Now, if you're in this area, if you're in the metropolitan Atlanta area, I, I, I am. There are several certified community teams. Okay, you got you. Several, you have several behavior help uh, got uh, organizations. You. Got you. And, and okay. Each one of them just about have a, a have an act team. Ah. Where you may be. not necessarily be called an act team, they may call it ah. a outreach community, whatever. But you know, it, it's pretty much playing the same role. You're in the community, you know, giving support. Yeah, right. that is true. Now, I don't know about the support coach uh, aspect, but I do know that every act team that I've ever seen or act teams that exist are required to have a CPS on the team. Um, they cannot yeah. function um, on the team without a CPS. It's, it's in their contract. In order to be a certified act team, you have to have a member um, who has lived experience on the team. Yeah. And that certification comes from the Georgia Substance Abuse Council? Um, and also yeah, the, um, for the care, you know, for care yeah. if you deal with if you deal with the sesame abuse part of it, it got to come from George sesame abuse. You got yeah, to have, you, you go. got to have, you got to be a CPS AD. You know, you have to have that. And then if you are dealing with the psychiatric part of it, you have to have a CPS certification for the George Mental Health Consumer Network. And that's, and that's just to say to say having gone through CARES and then passed your certification test. Yes, yes. Okay, got you, got you. Thank you so much, and that, very that informative. Com that network is the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network. If you wanna go on their website, they always have uh, opportunities to be accepted in the different trainings. Uh, personally, I think that that would be a great one to, to go to first. That way you can get a little bit of experience and then um, expand on with the care certification. Yeah. That's just my personal. Yeah, from my personal sphere, I will suggest, like he was saying, I will suggest that you get more. Because more and more today, with the, especially with the opioid epidemic, they are seeking CPS AD along with their CPS. 
Well, since this is a Georgia Council webinar, I'm going oh, to say which one goes first. But I will say <laughs> that they are both helpful. And, you know, they are, we're all here to serve the peers, you know, with our lived yeah. experience. Because it's my understanding that for the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network, you have to um, identify as a person right. who struggled with mental health um, challenges as well as with the Georgia Council, you have to identify with being a person who has the lived experience of struggling with um, substance use disorder. Is that correct? Because I'm not a TPS mental health. So that is true, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, I just had to do our plug, you know. So um, <laughs> yeah, why yeah, the yeah, yeah. is raised? Do you have another question? Yes, yeah, go ahead. Dwight, do you have another question? No. Uh, no, ma'am. That your answer my question. Just basically that uh, the referral. When you get a referral, would would say the Georgia Substance Abuse Council refer make make the referral to this to this act team. The, would they do that? No, no, no. no. We're you, have to, you have to keep your own employment. That okay. Right. That's that's what I'm that's what I'm yeah. curious about. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Been very informative. Thank you. <laughs> I wish. I don't have any more questions right now, guys. I, you want me to ask the questions, or do you got? Um, do you have more? And don't forget, I think you. No, we don't have another poll question. Let me look. Okay. Okay. Someone did the uh, ask something for a poll question. Somebody heard somebody mentioned whether or not they had an at team in their area. So okay. You can poll yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. You can poll. All right. So let's. I'm going to launch this next poll question, guys. Let's try to have 100% participation, please. <laughs> Is there an ACT team available in your city? Yes or no? All right. We're going to go ahead and close this. And we have 91% peers on here that say yes there is an act team available in your city and a me a merely nine percent said no so we are making some good progress that is good awesome job. good 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 stuff it's, it's also awesome that you even know what it is you know and that it's available that's awesome guys all right thank you very much you're welcome just to continue on with the slide so that way we don't we don't been um you know missed out on anything um this uh the cps is expected to complete the wellness recovery action plan with each peer uh the rap is an ongoing collaboration between the peer and the cps the rap is considered to be the cps comprehensive assessment tool the rap is designed and managed by the peer and the cps the goal of developing a rap is to empower the peer and acknowledging he or she has personal strengths and recovery is possible now, the RAP guides the peer in exploring behaviors and supports that have been or would be useful in decreasing and preventing intrusive or troubling feelings or behaviors. The ACT team will assist the peer with increasing personal empowerment, improving quality of life, and assisting the peer in achieving his or her own life goals and dreams. Dwayne, you want to put something in on that? Okay, no, you pretty much covered that. You know, but okay. I'll take the next slide. Okay, now we did the role of CPM. Now we're talking about the Awareness Recovery Action Plan, RAP, by Mary Ellen Copeland. Okay, now here are the key elements of the RAP, what the RAP consists of. First of all, awareness to about it's always good to allow, to allow the individual to tell you what worked for them. You know, because keep in mind, we're never here to fix anyone but to support them and become a whole yourself. You know, and I like to leave it, uh, I like to leave by approach of, I'm a lie, I'm a coach, I'm a, I'm a coach them to say the word, uh, uh, to come up with the idea. You know, instead of telling them what, you know, what, this, you know I would sometimes share what I did in that situation. But for the most part, I try to lead them into realizing their self with the answer else. And it's where the toolbox consists of. You simply ask the individual, what make you know what make you feel? They feeling depressed. What make you? What did you do the last time you felt depressed? 
Tell me some of the things that make you feel good. And that what you add into that world is toolbox. And that toolbox continues to grow as no matter how old they get, you know. And you gotta see how thick mine is now. And then that daily maintenance plan. What do you need to do each day to stay whole? What works for you? Not what someone else wants you to do, but what actually works for you. And that what they daily uh, a maintenance plan going to consist of. Now, when you're talking about identifying triggers and action plan, this is, when, this is when the wholeness, this is when the recovery actually starts taking place in this individual. When they can start identifying what caused them to be depressed? What caused me to want to use? You know, what come if I go over to this neighborhood, I go around this friend, you know, and this make me want to use, make me want to drink, then that is my trigger. And now what are you going to do about to stop that trigger? You know, then you heard the thing about uh, changing per people, places, and things. That would that may take effect, though. You know, when you're dealing with it from chaos, that would that may take but identify that trigger that caused you to do this. Is it when you become stressed at work? Is it when you uh, 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 have faced with a uh, conflict? Some people don't, don't like to deal with confrontation. If you face with a conflict. Now, when the individual get to this point here, when they get identified that early warning signs, now this individual will truly begin to live that recovery. Because now, before the little things that happen, oh, I become irritated. You know, two or three days before, you become irritated. You do this next. Now, when I do this, um, that normally lead up to me being triggered by something. That normally lead up to me making the decision to go around my triggers. So when you recognize your early warning sign, what actions are you going to take then so that you don't move forward into your trigger? You know, so that it, 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 it's imperative that you work with an individual in recognizing that. And even more so, because sometimes, no matter what we do, things can just happen. You know, we have no control of things that just happen sometimes. And when things are happening, you got to be able to recognize when things are breaking down. You know, give you a good example with me. If I leave my clothes laying around on the floor, uh, don't wash my dishes at night, don't make my bed up, open the curtain, let sunshine in, I know I'm headed in a negative direction. So I have to wreck in, do something that reversed me from going to that direction. You know, and then, and that's, that's when I, because I, 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 now I'm in control of myself, I'm in control. See, the rap plan help an individual be, able to be in charge of their recovery. Right. You know, so, you know, so now they're able, now I'm being in charge of my recovery because I'm recognizing when things about to break down. And now I'm taking an action to reverse that. Now I'm going back into my awareness toolbox and get something to reverse that. Now, this crisis plan. This crisis plan is something like uh, when I break down. Who I want to do with, who I want to get my bank card, who I want to get my my uh, my house keys, who I want to get my car, who I want to make what decision. This is something that you establish while you're in a whole in a wilderness state of mind. Right. That who you know that who you would like to do that. Now this post crisis plan is a plan that you establish once I start back doing this. You know, give me all my stuff back. You know. Because you have to have that into it for, you know, because this, this crisis plan, it's a temporary state. And I need you to, well, when I'm going through a crisis, I need you to be able to make this decision and that you be able to take care of this for me. But once I start back being responsible, I need you to relinquish all that responsibility that I gave you then and let me have the back. And that is what the World and Recovery Action Plan is real. That is that is an awesome way to describe it, Dwayne. I think you did an excellent job putting all of that into place and into perspective. And that's where where the the CPS comes into play as far as like <clears throat> implementing this wellness recovery action plan because we've actually lived this ourselves. Um, the, the post crisis plan, being able to get things back. Um, I like to describe it to my peers as pretty much like a roadmap for the recovery. Um, the roadmap can take us 
uh, in a positive direction or, you know, things happen and it can take us in a negative direction. This right here just gives us uh, ammunition in order to battle uh, when things are breaking down, um, things that you want to happen in the crisis plan, who, do, what hospital do I want to go to, um, what rehab center I, I definitely hate, uh, which doctors I don't want to talk to, um, things that I want you to do as far as like maybe you could sit down and talk to me when I'm in crisis and it could be just that simple as just wanting to talk um, or what you don't want to happen. Please don't call the police on me. I'm just having a moment. I don't want to go back to jail. I don't want to be back admitted into the hospital. If you could if you could do these certain things, I'm pretty sure that I can be OK. That that's that's the point of the wellness recovery action plan. And it's very important to understand these concepts of the action plan, because this is what we do as CPSs. This is something that we're going to work um, with our peers on constantly. Um, if we do one one month, we'll do another one, maybe two or three months afterwards, just to compare to see if things are the same. What are we going to add here? Um, what different triggers have we uh, come to realize that that we need to stay away from? Um, different people could evolve in our lives. Uh, maybe you, uh, somebody was a part of my crisis plan. Uh, the first, the first part of my recovery, but now I've grown and I've expanded, you know, my knowledge on on myself, and I don't want that person involved in my recovery anymore. So that that's why things are constantly changing, and we have to continue to to keep record of of things as time are going by. Great. Uh, but I think we can slide through this right here, um, and get right here to the uh, the progress notes. Um, on an ACT team, the CPS um, does bill Medicaid for their services. Uh, so in order for the, the, the progress note to be billable, it has to be done in this format. Um, it says GERP, which is a goal, intervention, response, um, progress, and plan. Um, so I think, uh, Dwayne, that you'll do great with um, trying to explain this, this progress note process. Okay. Now, when you talk about the GERT note progress, okay, as he's saying, you know, every every organization, if you get any money from Medicaid, you must have a CPS working there, someone with lived experience. And here, when the CPS do do this progress note, okay, the progress note is based on the treatment plan because the action that you use with the CPS, you know, with the with the client, must line up with what his treatment plan is. If you have an individual that he wants to get clean, you know, you write a note by you you helped him tie a shoe. Has nothing to do with him getting clean. Right. Unless you tie that into it. Now it can, you know. I mean the individual wants to learn how to tie a shoe to feel better by himself so he won't have to use your uh, substance to over uh, to feel uh to cover up feeling inadequate. You know, you could tie it, anything, you could tie it into it. You know, but, you know, anything that Medicaid wants for every individual you want, every response, Medicaid want to see that you use it, that you start every sentence with an action, with a verb. Every sentence, words like assess, observe, monitor, educate, accomplish, attain, provide, praise, encourage, assist, support. You know, this is what you want to hear. And to be a good note writer, Medicaid want to see you support this individual with something every 15 minutes. At least every 15 minutes, you support this individual. You're going to write an hour note, so you're going to have four sentences. You're going to have four paragraphs beginning with a verb where you supported this individual. Now, simply as, as relate with this whole progress note uh, tie in. So if you go on to the next slide, we can uh, we can tie that on the answer this one, you know, because that's where the progress is. Now, as you see, the next part of the note is the client response. You simply write what they said. Simply write their response to what you did, to what you did with them. That's all you want to know. Their response to what you did. And then moving forward from that, for a time's sake, you know. We want to talk about, you know, the progress. Next, you go, you go implement what progress did you and the consumer make to attaining the goal that was in their treatment plan? How much progress was there that made? You know, and then uh, from now, you want to be able to talk about the plan. 
the plan that you have for the uh, next, the next time that y'all get together, for, for the next session that you all have, you know, because you want this to be a continuation. You know, every time you see this consumer, you want it to be a continuation from the time that you've seen them before until they reach their goal. You know, and, and listen, it, it may vary. It may vary. It could be very, uh, individuals may want independent living. So you may have to support this individual and learn how to clean, clean the house, learn how to wash their clothes, you know, even learn how to fix a meal for themselves. You know, even learn how to keep their personal hygiene up. All that is working toward their, to their treatment plan. That is fulfilling their treatment plan for independent living. So, and their plan, their plan only consists of what I'm going to do with you next time. You know, plan for the next session. You know, so that's a, and that's a way that you can keep up with. You can have your notepad, a memo, session, or what's your plan for this individual next session. It makes it so much easier when you go in, when you go see this individual. Because you already know, okay, this is what we did. And you may want to review, you know, what y'all did. You know, when you go see it, want to review it and see how much that they attain or how much you may need to go over again. Yeah, and then from job. there, yeah. And then from there, on, we're gonna, uh, 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 we talked about beginning this. So now, do anyone have any more questions? Any questions or comments? Yeah, I think one of the essential. Okay. I'm sorry, peer, go ahead, um, Tramiel. I wanted to read this slide as one of the essential methods of peer support is the ability to collaborate with peers and make personal connections. So let's get down to it. Like, if y'all want to ask some questions, and um, I know that this this section of the, the slide show, the GERP progress note, is probably unfamiliar to a lot of people. Um, but, I mean, it's, this right here just gives you an outline of this is how you get paid. For real, for real. This is how you. This is how the company gets paid. This is how the team gets paid. So once you follow this outline on the progress note, it pretty much guarantees that you you are doing your job with the individual. You are performing interventions that are helpful to the individual achieving their goals. You are talking about what that individual said, even if they said, "I don't know, I don't get the point of doing this. I think all of this stuff is silly." This is what we write down in the response. In the progress, uh, the individual um, is showing progress <clears throat> toward their goal, um, but it's showing a bit of resistance. This is just what you're going to write down in the plan. Could be something as easy as a social outing. That's just what you put on the plan. It just kind of gives every, this note shows everybody on the team what you have been doing with the individual, where they are in their process of recovery, and and what we plan on doing next as a team. So let's, do let's get it, y'all. We got about uh, about 12 more minutes. So let's make it. Let's make it count. All right, let's get it. Okay, Belinda, you're going to start us off. I don't know if it's Belinda or Paula, but you are unmuted. Please unmute yourself. Hey, guys. Um, Dwayne, thank you. You broke that down to me a lot because I had seen that format, but I couldn't really get the gist of it. So you, you just helped me a lot with that. Um, my question is, with the peer, basically, how many times would you see that peer? Okay, I'm gonna see. I try to see each peer. Like I said, my uh, our caseload is about seventy people, and mm -hmm. I try to see each peer at least twice, at least twice a month. But see, the whole team, the whole team of a ten individuals trying to see this individual at least twice a month. Okay, so, so uh, if you're, if, okay, once you've seen them twice, then somebody comes in, they see them twice. So there's still ongoing progress with them. Yeah, yep. yeah. it is ongoing. Uh, for, for me in particular, we I see my caseload each individual um, once a week. I might see five individuals on Monday, Peter, Paul, Jane, John, and, and, and and carry, I guess, on Monday. And on Tuesday, I see another list of individuals. And on Wednesday, I see another list of individuals. And the following week on that Monday, I go back to my Monday schedule and I go back and I see those individuals. 
personally, I have about 30 to 35 people. I see about seven, seven peers a day. I try to break that down into an eight hour day, which sometimes can be difficult, but being time efficient is one of the, one of the ways in order for you to kind of secure the fact that you're going to see each individual once a week. Great, great. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, Dwight, you are unmuted. You had to unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, yes, I'd just like to ask now, you said that you meet probably with your clients uh, twice a month. Now, each time that you meet with your client, you have to write a progress or note. Yes. Right. Correct? Right. Yes. Okay. You now, you have, to do yeah. you have to write your progress note each time you meet with your client. Now, does the social worker also have to write, or, or, or if, if, if they only meet with you, or do they meet with everybody? Do they have to meet with the nurse, the clinician, the whole team? Does the whole team have to write a grip, uh, a, 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 a progress note on this individual? Yes. Yes. So every yes. everybody has to has has to chime in on this note. Right. Everybody has their own little space. Yes. Right. Every, yes. has everybody has it too. Yeah. Got you. Got you. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yes. And that's a great way. Okay. You brought that up because that's a great way for everybody to you know see the progress of the peer to see where they started. So that way each right. individual isn't doing the same thing with the with the peer. Like everybody takes a different approach. Um, so that way everybody can, everybody has the ability to view everybody's note too. So you can see what that person did or something that's not working for you. You can look in and see what's been working for somebody else. And maybe you can take a different approach. Right. Spelling is essential. Yes. Right. And, it, and that's why CPS, <laughs> play, why CPS plays such a major role. Cause the CPS is going to make that connection. And a lot of right. times, uh, a lot of times individual will open up to a CPS where they were shut down to a clinician. Exactly. So now the clinician can see how to how to how to get this individual to open up. Right, great. Thank you very much. All right, guys, we got a few more moments. We got let me see how long. It's 22 to eight more minutes. Any more comments, questions from somebody that we haven't heard from? I don't want to call a name. <laughs> So if I can please, please have someone to um, raise your hand. We want to hear from you. Okay. I got a poll question. Yeah. I got a poll question. You do, okay. but it ain't going to take a minute for that. We'll, can we do that in a minute or you want to do it now? Because yeah. I do have some no, hands right. All right, hands. Let's see. The Lisa Ward, unmute yourself. Hello. Can you hear me? We yeah. can. Okay. Um, hi. Um, yes, I'm looking forward to trying to be um, affiliated with, with CARES. Um, my question is um, because I was incarcerated and I noticed that, well, while I was there, I made it my business not to take mental health meds because I wasn't that stressed. And those that I did see that were taking meds and they were drowsy, um, you know, with being incarcerated, they don't really look at whether you're in recovery or not. Because I was in the RSAT program and the young ladies were like drowsy, falling asleep, and you know how they give their meds to other people, those type of things. But being out in the free world now, would you recommend... Um, or how would my question be? Um, now that I'm out, okay, real life is going to happen. Um, to not take a full dosage of medication or, you know, because the way that it alters your mind and with being in recovery. Listen, I cannot answer that because I'm, that is something that you really need to discuss with a doctor, you know, mm -hmm. someone at a medical oh. field. Yeah, because I cannot. I cannot test that with a ten foot pole. <laughs> okay, well, do, do okay, well, do you see where that may become a problem with with peers, like um, yeah. taking metal? Right, that is a big issue. That is a big issue with okay. peers 
for taking their medication. That is why, because not only that, you know, uh, uh, medication can have certain effect on certain individuals. What work for one person may not necessarily work for the next. So it is a go through. It is a process where the doctor has to have to find the right medication for each individual. But I strongly suggest that any individual, whatever a medication that they prescribe, that they take it uh, take it according to the prescription that they have given. Then I'm there also as Tremere uh, mentioned earlier in this earlier that I'm there to advocate for this pill. This pill feel like this medication it causes them to be too drowsy, you know, uh, uh, well, I'm there to advocate with that pill. Notice I said with that pill, not for. I'm able to advocate with that with that pill, you know, that you know that, that the med that the doctor take a look at the medication that they have been prescribed. Okay. Okay, just but to yeah, say no that I... no... yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, you have no way of knowing whether the medication works for you unless you take it as prescribed. Okay, yeah, because I was saying that I would, I me personally, I would, if I had to take something because of, you know, now that I'm out, um, I will let my doctors know that I am in recovery and I wouldn't want the full dosage of the medication due to it, you know, due to what it can, how it can make me drowsy in that manner. Okay, a lot, of, a lot of the medication that you get, a lot of the medication that, that a doctor would give would be none, uh, 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 what, you, what you call it, it was not, we're not causing a relapse. It, you yeah. know, it's, it's not a narcotic, so we're not causing a relapse. Okay, okay, that answered my question. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tremel, what were we talking about the other day? The other day we were talking, you said, you wanted to talk about um, something with the medication. Yeah, cause when, when I did my training at the CPS, they said that that was one of the things that you did not want to bring up with a peer. You didn't want to encourage medication. You did not want to um, discourage have bad have bad have bad uh, things to say about medication. But through my experience being on the ACT team and the way that the, it is set up, a lot of people want to talk about it. And as a peer, that's that's what I'm there for. I'm there to support them in any way that I can. So I sit and I listen. And the way that I I keep from making it be such a touchy subject is I just share my lived experience with it. When I first started taking medications, I honestly felt like I didn't want it. I didn't need it. The, the culture that I was raised in really doesn't believe in medication like this. So I had to take all of that stuff into consideration um, when I'm talking with somebody. Um, the different culture approach. I, I, I probe for different beliefs that they may have about medication. And then we go over the risk and the benefits of taking medication. That way, you know, I'm giving them ample opportunity to gain knowledge for themselves. And I'm not, I'm not in a position to tell them what to do. Great. All right, it's 628. We got one more poll question. Is it all right to do the poll question, guys? Let's do it. Yeah. Is it a poll question? Wait a minute. I think that it's a um I think y'all had a question. Wait a minute. I'm trying to find it. Was it real or not beneficial? Yes, right. Go ahead and ask because I don't even I don't see it. What's, what's this what's this webinar beneficial? Right, that's what it was. Anybody want to share? Was this webinar beneficial to you? Um is it gonna you're gonna do be able to use it with your work or understand more or you let's see raise your hand belinda 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 unmute yourself yes ma'am it this webinar was very beneficial Mello, dwight thank y'all you know you answered a lot of questions that i had been pondering over within myself and you know i heard someone say earlier today face my fears and that grip format was one of my fears mm. you know would i be able to you know do it the way it's supposed to be done you know and even with the uh with the rap you know i i thank you guys because with the way y'all put yourselves into it and then i turned around and put me into it then i can totally understand it 
much better. So I applaud you guys. Thank you so much. Well, and you. Laurie, you know you the ball. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. I, I took, let me see what time it is, because um, it's 6.30. We're done. Hey, yo, I Paul. everybody you came. I want to give an extra special thanks to um, Mello and Dwayne for putting this together and um, for all the information they were able to share with us. I want to thank everybody for their participation. I really appreciate it. Y'all made us. It's a great webinar. And um, I do want to remind you that in a day or two, you will receive an um, email. It'll serve as your confirmation of being in this webinar as we do not send out certificates and you all will receive 1.5 CEUs for attending this webinar. Thank you so much and everybody be safe. I wanted to do a plug. The Georgia Council is hosting virtual um, all recovery meetings every day or every weekday at 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. You can go to our website for more information. If you need to um, get information from Travel or Dwayne, email me and I will give you their email address or I'll get, get yours to them. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. All right. All right. Thanks, Louis. Yes. That's thank it. you. Thank guys. you. Thank, thank you. you. Hey, Tremel, thank you, bro. Oh, yeah. Thank you, man. You did a great job, man. I appreciate hey, it. Man. So did you, man. So did you, man. I like working with you.